David is also a contributor to PBS NewsHour, full disclosure. Later, David will be part of the closing keynote session. Thanks for joining us. Oh, good to see you. Weird to see you in Miami. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a little warmer. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is the live stream. So what's your keynote going to be about in case people aren't watching yet? Um, it's a moral renewal. <laughs> moral, that's a small topic. That's a small topic, but how the country, you know, as we're sitting here upstairs, I was up in my hotel room watching the Cohen hearings. Yeah. And that's like a moral descent, whatever you think of it. Mm. Uh, and so the country has to have some sort of moral renewal, and I think journalism has an important role to play in that. Part of the story of what Cohen and Trump is people who, who lie, who don't tell the truth, uh, and who spin. And So how do journalists... Uh, deal with that topic and contribute to what you're talking yeah. about? Well, deeper than that to me, and the, the big obsession of my life these days is social isolation and social fragmentation, right. uh, the decline of social capital, the rise of loneliness, the rise of suicide, the rise of depression, uh, society just falling apart. And so I started something uh, at the Aspen Institute called Weave, the Social Fabric Project, which is really go around the country and report on the people who are building community, who are the okay. solution to the problem and ask what can we learn. And one big takeaway is that the solution is out there. There are millions of weavers all around the country. Second, they're local. They're, they're not in Washington. They're doing their work at a after day care program in uh, Houston. I met a guy in Ohio who runs a boxing ring where he nominally teaches boxing, but he really teaches life to young men. Uh, I met a guy, a wo woman in, uh, uh, in Athens, Ohio, whose husband had killed her, himself and their two kids. Oh. And she gives her life away to show that whatever he tried to do to her, he's not su going to succeed. She's going to have a life of mm. purpose. And we met those people everywhere. We just have to focus attention on them. And this effort the Knight Foundation is doing, giving money for local journalism, I think that's the way to focus attention on where the, the solutions to our problems are coming. So I is there a, a reason that we are not seeing the stories of the weavers versus where spending a, a tremendous amount of time on the people who are tearing at that right. fabric. Yeah, there are weavers and rippers, and we tend to cover the rippers, partly because we have a bias toward covering politics. Uh, we have a bias toward this obsession with Trump. It drives ratings. It drives page views at the New York Times. Uh, but, and it's harder to tell the story that people are doing good because, A, there's not the obvious conflict. You can't drive traffic by being Republican versus Democrat. And it takes place on a deeper level. These people live for relationship. They're not interested in fame. They're not interested in money. They just want to do something good for their town. And they want to feel in right relationship to other. And that's a deeper emotional story to tell. And we, you know, in journalism, we're trained what, where, who, when, the facts. But it's harder to write a story about, um, about, connect, about emotional connection. We're not trained to do that. We journalists tend to be a little emotionally avoidant, probably. <laughs> and, and Who's doing it well? Is there, is there an archetype of media that has, I know there's a solutions journalism yeah. network, et cetera, like, but, but what are the sort of architects of that doing better than the mainstream? Yeah, uh, I was going to mention David Bornstein's group, Solutions Journalism, yeah. which has gotten some money from uh, Knight. Uh, we're trying, we've got a website uh, called Weave, the Social Fabric Project, where we every day we have more stories just showing the details <laughs> of this. And I will say it's hard. Uh, when you write a story knocking somebody down, it's just the conflict drives itself. And I think one of the things uh, Solutions Journalism Network has learned is you've got to move the conflict. So the conflict is not how do we destroy, the conflict is how do you get this done? We've got this really complicated problem, how do you figure this out? Right. And so that's the curiosity there. I found in a lot of the people we try to cover, it's their own lives are so amazing. That mm -hmm. drives the drama. We have a video up now of a woman um, named Agnes McKean who lives in Klamath Falls, Oregon, rural Oregon. And her son committed suicide uh, three years ago at age 14. And she says, when Harrison died, my love for Harrison didn't go away. It just mm -hmm. had to flow somewhere. And so she helps other families in her community, which is riven by suicide and opiate addiction. And so their lives are so dramatic. They illustrate a better way to be. And um, counter that now with what the platforms are optimized for, which is really um, engagement, but really right. that's about how long people will stay on a site and keep clicking. Right. That often does not happen with stories about Harrison. It right. does happen when there is a conflict there. Right, and you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter, as we all have to be now, uh, and it's just the opposite of what I see at Weave or mm -hmm. what I see around here. It's just, you know, you, you, get, well, you go viral when you make a, an attack on someone. 
right. and you get retweeted like that. Uh, to try to do this, I'm looking for the kind of Twitter where it's about this. You know, I'm not, I, last night I started following Krista Tippett, who does, has this show on me, because every year maybe through her I'll find other tweeter people who are good. <laughs> um, but I'm looking for that, but mostly it's just politics on my Twitter feed. Uh, and, you know, I, I just think we all have to make a cultural shift, of, and I think we're going to do it. I mean, we're not going to want to live in the Trump soap opera, whether it's Trump or a Democrat, forever. Hmm. We're going to want to live in a, in a world where, like, we can feel good about ourselves. And so I think there has to be some sort of emotional and moral rebound from this moment. What is your optimism grounded in? Just the physics of rebounding? Well, some of that, but, you know, like, we go to Wilkesboro, North Carolina, and we see, are there any weavers here? And within a day, we find 100. They're out there. They're a movement that doesn't know they're a movement yet. Hmm. And whether they're in red America or blue America, they talk the same. They believe in equality. They believe in hospitality. Uh, they believe in, you know, relationship building. And so I, I'm, my sense is that moral recoveries happen from the ground up. It happened sort of in the 1890s in this country. We had a civic revival that later led to a political revival. And I think that can sort of happen again. And is there... I mean, so the, the weavers and the people that you're meeting in these places, is it fair to say that for them politics is not nearly as important as it is to us and the press and, uh, you know, and how we frame national conversations? Yeah, I, they, you know, we were literally in places that are 80% Trump and 100% Democratic, and Trump never came up. And they're, they're working at the foundation of society, at a level of community and relationship. Politics and the market are built on top of a web of trusting relationships. And it's the web that's in trouble. And so they're not narrowly political. They are broadly political. They, they tend to be very angry about some of the injustices in society, whether it's racial injustice or inequality or feeling unrepresented, unrecognized. Hmm. So they're, they're not like touchy-feely good people. Right. They're really angry while they're trying to do good. Uh, and that anger shows up again and again. And frankly, a lot of suspicion of people like me shows up. I come at them with the Aspen Institute hmm. and the New York Times. I come with a lot of elite baggage, mm -hmm. and it takes a while for them to see um, I really am there to try to celebrate them and illuminate them. Right. Uh, they're very suspicious of, of elites. And it, so when they're in this conversation with you, do you find, is there something that disarms them, convinces them? What, what is the threshold where they say, all right, that David Brooks guy, he's not horrible? Yeah, well, mostly if I try to talk back to them what they're saying to me. And that's the best I can do. What I find, I've, I've met a lot of guys. I met a guy in Houston who's a Marine, white guy, went into a, an African-American neighborhood to try to help the neighborhood. And it really took him two or three years before, because so many people have come saying, I'm here to help, and then they leave. And so neighborhoods are naturally resistant to some new person coming in saying, I'm here to help you. No. And so for most, it takes an incredible amount of time to earn trust. Um, and what part of this weave message do you think can resonate with communities? I mean, is it basically, are we hungering for seeing the good in others inherently? Or uh, do we think that this is some sort of a foreign idea that's, you know what I mean? Let's yeah. say. I, I just think it's, we need a creedal shift. We've written this manifesto, which we call the relational manifesto. Basically, my whole life, we've lived in a culture that's very individualistic that says life is an individual journey toward personal happiness, personal fulfillment, self-expression, self-actualization, maximum personal freedom. And when you have a culture that's super individualistic, you weaken the ties between people. So I think we need a cultural shift that's not about individual, but it's about relationship. And that we grow out of our relationships, it's we before me. And we, our quality of our lives is measured not by how much success or individual happiness but what's the depth of the quality of our relationships? Now, this is David Brooks sounding almost, uh, well, by some farther conservative people, communist. <laughs> well, you could do it both ways, because uh, there was a strand of conservatism. My hero was Edmund Burke, a 19th, 18th century philosopher. It was all about society, the social fabric. That really controls. But there's left community and there's right community. I'm happy to embrace them all. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, what's your personal evolution been here? I mean... Uh, you know, you still look on Twitter and you are a, relatively speaking, depending on who they're reading, uh, a, a boogeyman from the conservative movement and the right. And then there are others who will say, well, he's kind of a centrist. He's not really, because he's not for Trump and he's not really a hard Republican, right? Yeah. But as you've evolved through your life, what, what's the, what are you learning? Well, two things. I've learned I'm a Whig. 
the You're 19th, awake. I'm awake. And there are only six of us. But in the early <laughs> 19th century, there's like a liberal movement that yeah. believes in user government to enhance equality, conservative mo movement, small government to enhance freedom. There's another Alexander Hamilton, then Whig tradition, limited but energetic government to enhance social mobility. Okay. And so I was raised by my grandfather, sort of immigrant mentality. We're going to try to make it here in America. And that, that would be where I would position myself. It just doesn't have a political home. David Brooks, the Whig. You heard it here <laughs> first. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.